Yes, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, it's like an honor to sit here in front of you at your feet. Wallahi, um, I've been following you for like before even your Arabic class. Um, SubhanAllah, you were like the, the superhero after Sheikh Imran Hussein for me. The, so, I know you feel know that you. way. And uh, you know, the thing is, is that the, the goodness people feel about a certain Sheikh is actually their own goodness. Because the sheikh is never as good as the people think. Alhamdulillah. Right? Uh, the sheikh is never as good as uh, the people would assume. Of course, having a good opinion about your shiuch and your teachers is important because that is a reflection upon, upon you. Mm -hmm. Right? And uh, that's a reflection upon you to have a good opinion. I would never have a bad opinion about any of my teachers, even when I disagree with them. So I might, you know, disagree with uh, Dr. Ahmed or even Sheikh Imran Hussain mm -hmm. but I would not want anyone else saying anything against them, even if I disagree with them on something. Mm -hmm. You see, so because it, it's not their knowledge, and uh, you know, Sheikh Imran Hussain, people don't know this, but he's actually a very, very humble person. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my uh, first interaction with Sheikh Imran Hussain happened in the Queen's Masjid in New York. And uh, I had heard uh, that Sheikh Imran Hussain had given bayah to Dr. Isra Ahmed. I don't know if you're familiar, any of you are yeah. familiar with Dr. Yeah, Isra. of course. And uh, so, you know, I was like, Sheikh Imran Hussain, uh, who's that? I don't even know him, right? So I was, we were living in Chicago. So we had, Isra Ahmed was, Dr. Isra Ahmed had come to New York for a dars of Quran. And we had heard that this, you know, big scholar, that was a khatib in the United Nations gave bayah and like okay that's anyway I came to the uh, Queen's Masjid and you know we came with our sleeping bags and everything and so I went upstairs and the lights were off but someone was vacuuming and uh, so I brought and I'm like who's this old man vacuuming the masjid in the dark that makes no sense right so I like go up to him and like, oh, you know, let, let me vacuum. And he's like, uh, I'm like, what's your name? He's like, my name's Imran. No way. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. SubhanAllah. And he's vacuuming the masjid. And uh, that's what he was doing. Picking up little pieces that the vacuum wouldn't pick up. Right. And uh, just, uh, and then I was, I was trying to take the vac. I didn't know. I, when he said his name is Imran, I knew it was. The, the scholar that I had heard that gave bayat to Dr. Asra Ahmed and uh, anyway that, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, uh, event or series of events that took place but uh, he's actually very humble another thing about Sheikh Imran Hussain I've never shared with anyone is he would fall asleep in everyone's lectures <laughs> because he, it was boring to him. He was like, okay, whatever. Because <laughs> he had these, when you when you give bayah to Dr. Asrah, you have to take these classes. It's like a muptadi. It's called the muptadi camp, the, the beginner's camp, to like acclimate you to the jama'ah and, and to the verses of the Quran that the jama'ah is based upon, which was a movement to reestablish khilafah with Quranic teaching. Anyway. So, you know, so we had, like, I was speaking, Dr. Abdusami was speaking. I think even Noman was at that time speaking. I'm not sure. No, 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 Noman was too young. He was still eight, eight, he was still young. Uh, he, he didn't know Arabic at that time when uh, <coughs> Sheikh Imran Hussain uh, gave bayah. And, uh, and so, you know, he would just, you know, and then there was this one speech because, you know, he was like a sheikh, right? So now he was given the honorary uh, end of the camp speech was given to him. So he was like the, a big scholar. And at that time, I don't know if you know this, but there was a time in the 90s, the early 90s, where there were two speakers in, in, in across the U.S. The most famous speaker was Sheikh, uh, Sheikh, Imam Siraj Wahaj, yeah. if you ever remember him. Imam Siraj was the one who made these cassettes and Islamic, like you could say, media popular in the U.S., Okay. He is the fundraiser of almost every, virtually every masjid. He was the fundraising expert uh, in the U.S., right? And Imam Siraj, man, he's like something else. He's a very wise man. But anyway, in New York, there were two people very famous for speaking in this uh, tri-state area. That's he New was York, part of Ma Malcolm X. Malcolm X uh, he, he was part of Malcolm X. Um, 
one of the movements, right? Sir Imam Sir Oh Azhar. yeah, he was part of the Nation of Islam one time. Yes, of Islam. That's right. Yes, yes, he was part of the Nation of Islam. And then uh, the other person who was very famous in the New York tri-state area for his speeches, meaning very eloquent in speaking, was Sheikh Imran Hussein. And as you know, even today, he's very eloquent in speaking. But if you go back to like our early days of the 1990s, he was more eloquent than he is today. Nowadays, you know, he's just also tired. <laughs> he's like, I'm just giving it, right? So a lot of that eloquence has, has, has comparatively gone down. But I remember there was one speech, the ending speech of the Muftadi camp that he gave that like blew us all away because he started his speech with a glass of water. And the last sentence of his speech was the last gulp of water he took. And then he put down the cup as if making a point, right? I'm alone. Uh, so he was very eloquent in, in how he conveyed his message. And, and even uh, at that time, he had a lot of emphasis on spirituality. And I remember uh, Dr. Israhim Rahmatullah saying that the lack that what Tanzim Islami was the name of the organization. What Tanzim Islami lacks in spirituality, inshallah, will be covered by the coming of Sheikh Imran Hussein. Uh, but, you know, Sheikh Imran Hussein was told by Dr. Sarmad, okay, pack your bags, go to Pakistan with me for two years. So he left his UN job and went with him for two years. Mm -hmm. Right? That's the type of uh, commitment. We're, we're, and people don't know that uh, the type of commitment it takes a lot of commitment to talk about the same topic over and over and over again, not because, you know, that's all you know, but because you're so committed to seeing what other people don't see, you're so committed to for them to see what you see, that even though you have 100 other topics to talk about, you're going to stick to what you think is important at that time. And that takes a lot of because even like I'll tell you about myself. Sometimes if I'm repeating a topic someone so much and one of the students will say, oh, we already heard that. Then I'll be like, okay, okay, fine. We'll talk about something else today, right? Because I don't want to bore them. But like some scholars, like Dr. Sarahmad, he did not care. He talked about the topics he wanted to talk about, right? Uh, Sheikh Imran Hussein talks about the topics he wants. Like he knows what he wants, right? And that's what he wants from the ummah. He's very clear and decisive in that. And so, you know, uh, one day uh, when this issue came up about talking about the same issue or pounding the same issue rather, right? Uh, he said, well, a speaker can talk about different topics, but I'm not a speaker. <laughs> you know, I am a teacher and the teacher has to teach what he has to teach. And so that's kind of like how they, they looked at it. Anyway, sorry for... <laughs> no, no, that, that was, that was brilliant. brilliant. Yeah. Really, no problem. Um, I, yeah, just just a quick <laughs> introduction to myself. Um, I'm from Vancouver, Canada. Uh, I grew up my whole life here. Um, I've been following Sheikh Imran Hussain for like, you know, the anniversary date is actually my how old my daughter is, so I know exactly how long I've been following him. And so I've been literally following him for over ten years. Um, and it's a culmination of all the knowledge that I've learned from him and from you and from Dr. Isar Ahmed and a few a bunch of other people, and. And then I got my mind stuck on Surah Rahman. And when he, when Sheikh Imran Hussein is telling you that there is something in Surah Rahman that you need to think about. And so, subhanAllah, the way this group came together, the way this team came together, oh man, it's, it's unbelievable. And it's like as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is helping us. I, and I know I'm trying to, it's, it's going to sound like some angelic. No, 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 I agree. But it's, I agree. But it's not. Mm -hmm. Because even, even the equipment that I got to do all these things, some of it came for free. And then the timing was a bit, subhanAllah. But so anyway, so we came together and we've had these chats and I've gotten to know, gotten to know these, these brothers. And then I started telling them about Surah Rahman. And then we went deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until we have made something. And I think you, uh, once you have a look at it, we are we actually, we want your opinion because we are not scholars and we want to... Uh, see what you have to say. Yeah, um, actually, yeah. So it's uh, brother Imran who um, he insisted on Surah Rahman, and something told me as well at the time. We all connected before that, um, but something told me that because it seems like brother Imran has been awake far longer than any of us, 
And so the fact that he had so much information from this Surah Rahman, I thought, why not? We're going to study the Quran together, but why not? Let's do what uh, Im uh, Imran says. Actually, I've just realized your name is the same as Sheikh Imran Hussein as well. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, so he wanted to study Surah Rahman, but we had no idea what we were in for. And again, just like how he's saying, right, it sounds crazy. And even as I'm saying, it's like I'm waiting for someone to tell us we're crazy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's why we've got you here now to see. Um, let's bounce some of these things off you because I've spoken to another two brothers about what we've been discussing. And uh, they said that, yeah, we should compile this into something proper. We should make uh, YouTube videos and we should get this information out there because if someone like yourself could confirm that uh, at least some, if not all of what we're thinking is accurate, then maybe that will lead on to others looking deeper into the Quran the way we are and using the information that we have. I hate to say it, but basically from the conspiracy perspective, uh, understanding the world today, because um, it seems like uh, if I'm right in what I'm saying, the Quran means several things for different people of different times. Yes. So, so it seems like what we as students are uh, discussing and uncovering together, it seems like Surah Rahman has a very profoundly different meaning for us today. So yeah. just on, on that point, j just yeah. so that because you're students of knowledge and, and yeah. so there is Shaulila Muhaddas Delmi Rahmatullah he uses two words. There's Da'wilul Am and Da'wilul Khas. Da'wilul Khas is the interpretation according to a specific uh, setting of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? But after that, there's a, there's a general interpretation which could be different from Da'wilul Khas, mm -hmm. right? Depending upon which perspective, are you taking a fiqhi perspective, a historical perspective, an eschatological perspective? So the Quran is like that, that there is a, and unfortunately the ulama, they only study ta'wilul khas. They don't study the mechanics or even don't even look at the Quran from the perspective of ta'wilul am. Uh, and, and that's where the, the, the next generation of scholars have to be those people who are connected to the Quran rather than Islamic law as their primary lens of seeing mm -hmm. and, and number two they have to be experts in which means you have to be able to connect the world around you what's happening around you with the quran to make it living otherwise it's something in the past only yeah Absolutely. i like how you use the word mechanics because uh what we will be showing you inshallah is uh, Kind of mechanical. Okay, go, mechanical go for it. Okay. I'm excited. Allah. I'm excited. Let's, let's, let's begin. Let's I think we built it up yeah. already enough. I think. And, uh, and uh, well, when we started this journey, it went as uh, Brother always said. It went from why not when she, uh, Brother Imran suggested we study Surah Rahman. It went from why not to now we must. From why not <laughs> to we must. Okay. So it's uh, yeah. Let's begin. So. Okay, Abdullah. Bismillah. Uh, you're you're muted again. Yeah, oh, there. yeah. Uh, I will try to recite. Uh, if it comes up, let me know. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-wajim. Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. R-Rahman r-Rahim. Maliki yawm iddin. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Okay, we shall begin. Um, so we are on Surah Rahman. And so the, the biggest ayah, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeat one verse 31 times in one surah? Nowhere else in the Quran does he do this. And why would he do this? Sheikh Imran Hussein says that he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is knocking, knocking, knocking at our heads. And it is, and it has a link to Akhir zaman the end times or the end game. Because these two people in this verse are talking about two evil people. And even your student, Sheikh Omar, Noman Ali Khan, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats this verse 31 times because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angry. He is angry at these two people. 
So who are these two people? And what I'm about to say, this is 1400 years old, this book. And still today, it's still going to amaze people. Okay, Bismillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats one verse. Fabi ayi ala irabbiku ma tukadhiban 31 times. Check. If you flip 31, you get 13. And 13 is exactly where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts. Fabi ayi ala irabbiku ma tukadhiban. Okay. Which, which, which is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats the first verse. Uh, first repeated verse. Yeah, that's then, right. That's right. Allah it's the 13. Allah, yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats one verse 31 times. And if you flip it, you get 13, which is the same way he started. Why? Mm. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in verse 31? We are going to deal with you both. So go ahead, Sassan. Sure. Like, uh, uh, you want to go ahead? Yes, so, yeah, so basically what, what we're asking people is, do, do, do other people see what we see, which is, well, first of all, uh, from what I understand, numbers don't seem to be given much regard when it comes to understanding the Quran. But when I, as you're aware, I'm obsessed with Christian scripture, and they seem to, they seem to be ahead again in uh, using numbers in terms of trying to decipher certain meanings or certain mm. connections within their mm. scripture. So Brother Imran kind of highlighted this to us. So, yeah, the question is, in Surah 55, in Surah uh, Rahman, why does Allah, you know, why is verse 13 repeated 31 times? You know, 31 is the mirror. You know, like how he said, 31 is the mirror of 13. And is it a coincidence? Well, like here, how he's saying, when you look at verse 31, what Allah is saying, it seems as though, it appears as though, obviously Allah knows best, but to us, it appears as though Allah is repeating verse 13, 31 times. And if we're wondering who is he referring to as these two people, we look at verse 31 as well. What is verse 31? Like he says, we will deal, we'll deal with both of you. And um, so, yeah, it just, it just sets us in this um, research of the number 13, especially as the information comes out. The, uh, amongst the Christians that the people of rebellion are referred to, you know, the number 13 basically represents the people of rebellion. Sorry, I'm putting words into that. Number 13 itself represents rebellion. So we're beginning to think from our research that 13 means, you know, it's, it's a representation, it's a numerical representation of the people of 13. And mm. um, yeah, they're very clear in biblical scripture because, you know, if you talk about Revelation 13, whether you talk about, okay, yeah, so basically, yeah, what do you think at that point before we carry on, Sheikh? No, this is perfect. This is great. Okay. Uh, I, I would also like to focus on the word, uh, the word faragh as well as thaqalan and what it has to do with these people, what they're trying to do with uh how it what they're doing relates to thaqalan thaqal means gravity or oh yes okay. you know so uh i would also be interested in that i mean what you're pointing out is awesome it's really great mashallah okay alhamdulillah well yeah so to add to that um it seems there are a few numbers that these people uh well let's just call them who they are what do we call them uh, the people of Satan, the, whether it's the Illuminati, the secret societies, wherever you want to call them, those that are essentially serving Satan. You know, as we understand from Sheikh Irman Hussein, who said, you know, like the people of the UN, etc. But anyway, uh, so before we go ahead further, it seems as though that they are themselves using the number 13 and 33 as well. Yeah. Amongst yeah. other numbers, but 13 and 33 is most prominent. Uh, we, we can do a whole session on the number 13. We can do a whole lecture series on the number 13. It's endless. It's everywhere. Um, and it's not just by chance. Uh, as you're aware, I mean, I, I shared with you the information about the 13 bloodlines of the Illuminati. That's just one mm. example. Uh, the brothers here will mention many uh, as we go ahead. Um, uh, but yeah, if we look at verse 33, uh, Imran, have you got verse 33? By any chance, uh, have you got it there? Uh, 
Well, between verse 31 and verse 33 is that for the a year I lay Rabbi Kumar to Kadiban, because obviously it's repeated several times. Right. But uh, verse 33 is Ya Ma'shar al Jinni wal Insi. 31, okay. So now 33 or 31? Yeah, 31, 31. Though. No, no sorry, 33, 33. Uh, yeah, Ma'shar al Jinni, what is it? In his study, what are they? Yeah, so go ahead, if, uh, sorry, go ahead, please explain what Sheikh, you remember. Yeah, uh, Brother Awais, uh, Brother Imran, uh, let's hold off on 33 now. Uh, let, okay. we, we will show Sheikh all the evidence on 13. So, Sheikh, uh, first of all, uh, 13, as we will show you, there is a lot of uh, significance to this number uh, associated with symbology, okay? Mm. And uh, uh, first of all, we when we started uh, uh, studying Surah Rahman, we started to see a pattern in Surah Rahman that Allah, Allah is talking, Allah is just talking. It's, it's just, uh, he's just, uh, it's a monologue. Uh, and from verse 1 to verse 12, it's a monologue. Allah is just saying. But from verse 13, he starts addressing to a specific audience. And that audience is the alliance of human beings and shaitan mm. who have been denying Allah's blessing. So mm. verse 1 to 12, Allah is kind of uh, in a monologue and he's uh, describing all of the wonders of his creation. And I wrote uh, a document of this, I will send you, inshallah. But verse 13, Allah now starts interrogation of these of this alliance of human beings and shaitan. And he starts the interrogation by pointing out their fault. What is their fault? Their fault is denial. Like, why did you deny my blessing? Oh, you too. You too, the uh, human beings and shaitan who are forbidden to ally with each other. And this alliance itself is den denial of Allah's blessing because Allah gave us our space and time, gave them their space and time. And uh, he's saying, like, be in yourselves. But why did you ally? So it's a denial. So there are two factors to why Allah repeats this verse 31 times. First, mm -hmm. the first factor is uh, we should, uh, Allah is give, giving them a subtle message by flipping the number 31. So we know that uh, in human history. And the, the thing word, is, if any of them picked up the Quran and went to Surah Rahman, they would find this immediately because they know this. They That's would know this, yeah. right? They would they would know this, and then it's on them how much they want to deny it. Yeah. And uh, Sheikh, so uh, uh, the first factor is uh, we know that uh, the worst punishment. No, so the general methodology you're using here, just to be clear, is, and I wonder if this can be used with other surahs. So this is why I'm trying to. Uh, take this uh, a little bit is that you're taking the verse of the Quran that is most repeated mm. and using the number of times that verse is most repeated mm. because this happens in many surahs but not 31 times mm. but you know three times five times six times and how does it relate to that ayah number in which uh, so let's say mm. in this case ayah number 13 right mm -hmm. uh Anyway, that's just as a methodology. So you're clear on what methodology you're using. Yeah. Okay. But Sh Sheikh, what are, you, what are your thoughts about the number 13 and it representing rebellion? What do you Allah think about Allah. Allah. Uh, Allah. Uh, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Go can on. I finish? Then the first. Then Sheikh. Yeah, go. So Sheikh, the two factors are the first factor is we know that uh, the worst punishment came on the people of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, where they, they were a lot. Allah took the people of Lut all the way on the wing of uh, Angel Jibril, and then they were flipped, flipped and smashed on, onto the onto our uh, space and time. So Allah is giving them a subconscious message that by flipping that number, that this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to be flipped over. And the second factor is the verse 13 is repeated in 31 times to show them the flip. But in verse 31, Brother Imran, can you go to verse 31? Um, 31, yeah. Sanafrahu lakum ayyuhat taqala. Go there. 
by the word ala, the word fabi ayi alai, alai also means punishments. Generally, we translate it as favors. Oh. But the word alai could refer to, like, for example, Allah says after the hellfire, right? Uh -huh. Right? Oh. Yatufu alayhim, uh, exactly. Right? Allah mentions it after the health. Ala is not trend, it's not exactly favors. Interesting. It includes favors, it includes bounties, it also includes punishments. SubhanAllah. Okay, so, so Shaykh, when you put it that way, that fits more. Yeah, see, this is why we need you, Shaykh. So <laughs> Allah need Shaykh. will, first aspect is the bounties, because that's the tartib within Surah Rahman, the bounty of the world. Which of Allah's bounties do you deny, right? Then after everything is flipped over, now which of Allah's punishments do you deny? Exactly. Even, even better, the, yeah. Even the first better. factor is the flip, and the second factor is the address. So now Allah is telling them in verse 31, you who, who have denied my blessing, you know you will be flipped over. And in verse 31, first threat is indirect threat, the flip. That is the indirect threat. The second threat is the direct threat. So that is verse 31. In verse 31, Allah is telling them, you will both be dealt with. Who will be dealt with? The human beings and the jinn who have denied Allah's blessing by entering into alliance with each other. And now we will show you the symbology of the number 13, the evidence. So brother Iman, so uh, let's go to the dollar. First go to Operation Warp Speed. This one, sorry, it's uh, no operation warp speed, yeah. It's, yeah, right. in, it's Sheikh, in the bottom right, one. Corner there, yeah. So, Sheikh, uh, in the bottom right, you count the uh, uh, number of stars on the logo of operation warp speed, it's 13. One, uh, brother Imran, uh, can you count with your mouse? Um, one, can, two, can three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 11, 12, 13. So that, yes, yes. I got yeah. it. All right. All right. Now go to the dollar, brother and mother. So there's the 13 steps. Oh, you've got them labeled as well. Okay. That's good. Yep. And then this is the, the, yeah, yeah. the bring up, also the U.S. flag has 13 stars. The 13 exactly. original yes. colonies. Yes, that's right. Yep. The flag has yep. 13 stars. But the 13 that they're talking about, they're trying to make it seem like it's something good. Right, but it just is not. They're trying to get the, the, the cattle of mankind to think, oh, this it's the 13 colonies, not the Shaitan 13, mm -hmm. right? So the it's always the, it's probably trying to hide something. There are 13 steps on the pyramid, as you can see. And if you look at the dollar, the eagle is holding 13 olive branches, he's holding 13 arrows, he's holding uh, he has 13 over 13 uh, st uh, 13 stars over his head. And 13 mm -hmm. number of letters uh, which are there. And uh, uh, and another thing is we found, uh, Brother Imran, go to the slide of uh, the elevator one. Oh, by the way, before you carry on, wait, wait, before you move on from that, can you just go back to that pyramid? Mm. Yeah, and even Sheikh, that pyramid at the bottom, by the way. Yeah, so just a side note, you know the Roman numerals at the bottom? Yeah. Yeah, you can isolate 666 from those as well. Yeah, just a side note. But yeah, this is all embedded, 13 and 666. Mm. And so <clears throat> the number 13 is something that they cannot hide from. And so this is why they have um, Friday the 13th. And uh, they have, uh, you know, when they go to buildings, there's always something, there's always a... a the 13th is always skipped, either it's address, elevators, or hotels. Um, and there's a reason why that, right? They're trying to create this fake phobia uh, where you, because what happens is, I mean, just like today, everybody is so afraid of this coronavirus, you get scared and now you cannot think straight. And so when people cannot think straight, they look to authority to make the decisions for them. And this is how the kettle are being rounded up right now. And so this number 13, um, it has to do with fear, 
right? That's like their main weapon that they have is the fear, which is mind control. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So the question, the question becomes: as we're studying Surah Rahman, why would we become also obsessed with the number thirteen? Okay, fine. It's repeated thirty-one times. Yeah, um, but why would we become obsessed with thirteen, especially in today's age? Um, would you, I mean, would you understand that yourself, Sheikh? Why would we? Why would we care about the number thirteen in today's? I can age? see someone questioning that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So why would we care? I mean, it's it. Uh, I mean, I can answer it. I just thought I'd ask you if you can see it already yourself. Maybe you already understand. Are you asking about the picture in front of me? No, 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 just the number 13 itself. Why would we care as Muslims today, if we're connecting to the Quran, why would we care about the number 13? What it means in the world today. Yeah. I mean, are you saying that it has something to do with occult sciences? Yeah, exactly. You've got it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, so it, it, that, that's that's why the Muslims need to know. I mean, if you think about it, who's in charge of everything that is taking place today? We all we all know uh, that everything, and that means almost everything, is run uh, down to the thirteen families that run this world, right? The thirteen families mm. and uh, the the societies, this UN, whatever it is. I'm sure. I mean, maybe uh, Brother Iman will show examples of how. You know, how can we come to those conclusions? How can we say that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, again, it's, it's only for those who can see through the signs, through the symbols. So if you want to show some of the symbols. Of but the, it goes both the, ways, right? One is that uh, thir the number 13 may or may not have significance. But the Quran is confirming that it does. That's what it seems like. Yeah. Right? Not necessarily for the general public, but for the people that know about it. Right, right, yeah, yeah, for right. those who know, uh, yeah. And so, yeah, that's it. But then the question becomes, um, is this something that can be marketed to those who don't know anything about this, you know? Can this be directed, you know, or uh, in, uh, invited to the general public in a way? How is it that, you know, you'd be able to show them that there is something significant? I don't know if this is irrelevant, yeah. but I am number... The Ayah in Sutul Baqarah, Ayah 102, which is mm -hmm. the main verse about magic okay. and the the origin, the origination of magic. In Sutul uh, Baqarah is Ayah number 102. Ayah number one, 103 is very similar in meaning to Fabi Ayya Allah Irobikumat Kadiban. So that also becomes 13, uh, 103. No, but go on 102 first. Oh, 103. If you take off the O, it's 13. SubhanAllah. So this is the main verse about magic and where it began, right? And then in Sutul Baqarah, you also have uh, 103. And if they did believe, and had taqwa, it would have been better for them, right? Then the reward with Allah would have been better. If they only did but know. They only knew. SubhanAllah. And Shaykh, by, by day, Allah is referring to uh, uh, jinn and human beings, right? Yeah. yeah, and it's in the plural here. It's not in the dual, but it's referring to both the uh, people, all, all the groups involved in the magic. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is any coincidence because uh, Allah is uh, showing us. Well, it's not coincidence that you have one of the longest verses in the Quran, right? Which is what Taba'u Ma Tatlu Shayatin Wa Ala Mulki Sulaiman 102. And it talks about where all of this kind of like originated in Babylonia, right? And the relationship between Babylonia and maybe, I'm just guessing, but because I believe in the Quran, I can probably make a good estimate that there's probably some relationship between the number 13 and Babylonia. Uh, um, or, I, think, yeah. I think we've, I think we've, we've got, I will, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I believe that Ibrahim alayhi salam, his counter to the Babel when he went to Mecca, um, his, the tawaf that we do is the counter to the people of 13. Uh, it's kind of hard to, to grasp it right now, but as we get deeper into golden ratio, it'll become more and more clear. 
Um, there's also a lot of verses in Surah Maryam about Ibrahim alayhi salam and what his father said to Ibrahim alayhi salam that kind of made me think that. But anyways, we should go back to um, here. So th this is what I wanted to show is that um, actually the number 13 has a big thing. It's, it's a big thing in ancient Greeks and the, and the Romans and also the ancient Egyptians. And there are some, whenever I look at these things now, I look at things that there's a pattern. There's always a pattern. There's always snakes, owls, cows. They have numbers. And so there's something going on here with these uh, numbers. The dollar has an owl on it too, by the way. Mm, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Exactly. So this is the ancient uh, Egyptians. And so here's, again, they all have the staff, the calf with the snake in it mm -hmm. um and also uh this is exactly look at the, the ancient egyptians believe that there are 12 steps on a ladder to eternal life and the knowledge to and to take the 13th step meant going through death into everlasting life thus the 13th step is it is said that the soul reaches the source of itself and attains spiritual co completion so this has definitely has to do something with magic yeah, all of these celebrities, they, they walk up and down these 13 steps. Yeah, we see it all exactly. the time. So the reason why I think they do this, they're just, you know, just like how we pray Salah five times a day, they have to continue doing the same. You can probably thing. create like an arrival series just around this kind of like. I was, I was do I was going to think that. And I, I wanted to show people a different way though, not this yeah, arrivals yeah. and it, and it's just negative. And then people are just now just scared of Shaitan more than he's yeah. supposed to, you know, the other way around. But so what I did is I took the snake and I went and I searched the Quran and this is what I found. I found that anytime it talked about snake, it always talked about Musa alayhi salam, um, and, which is exactly where the pinnacle of magic By the way, th this is another thing now. You're, you're adding another methodology here. And it actually occurred to me and I bought a book on this. It's called The Dictionary of Symbols. Mm -hmm. right? And I was thinking of doing like a tafsir. And I wasn't going to think but i was going to in initiate not an entire tafsir but one of the types new types of tafsirs that i thought would be very interesting would be like a, a tafsir based upon sim symbolism yeah. right because right. i believe every symbol every word in quran is a symbol yeah and it's, it's an archetype it's type and of I think, archetype and i think uh, from from looking at all these symbols i have learned that they have they make these symbols using specific proportions and that is the way to find out who they are. If they're using golden ratio, then that means they have hidden knowledge, um, which yeah, is linked I, back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Yeah, Brother Iman's got something special on this golden ratio connection. Uh, he's looked into it for a long time. I guess we're still catching up with him on that. I know there's something very special on, on that. But what I'm, what I'm beginning to realize, Sheikh, is that you know how Sheikh Iman Hussein is always criticizing those who are looking at the Quran very literalistically as opposed to symbolically. Yeah, it seems as though when he's speaking about that, um, that generation that will come, what is it? How, is he, how does he describe the last, last show. reign of, what is it? Last show, last show. Yeah, the last show, last you know, show. of the scholars. It, I'm, I'm beginning to think, as crazy as it sounds, I think it's no wonder the media has made people who look at numbers, the media has made people who look at too many patterns and sequences yeah, as people who are kind of crazy. crazy. And I think it's, it's by design, you know, because actually they don't want anyone to engage in that part of their thinking, right? Which is probably the way that we, as this gen current generation of the end times, if you like, are going to be able to see more deeper meanings within this Quran. That's what it seems like. Okay, so what, one comment I have about this scenario, about looking at numbers and stuff, something I have noticed uh, and, and so maybe you can help me out here, is that when we do ruqya on people that are possessed yeah, by you jinn, said they're possessed. I know, I remember that comment. <laughs> uh, I noticed that they're big into numbers. Yeah. Like, they'll be like, why'd you do this? And why is this number there? I don't know, yeah. either the jinns themselves are possessed by these numbers mm -hmm. and always looking for number patterns, the mm -hmm. jinns are. And I don't um, know if looking for number pattern gives them some sort of strength Right. what it is um, but there is a relationship between number patterns and jinns there's no question it, about that yeah. I, I think it's because they can see uh, more than we can see yeah. it comes down to a uh, sacred geometry because mm. uh, 
when you uh, when you let's say you do something 13 times then that sh that number becomes a shape it's like uh, but you cannot see it but it's a it's a uh, it's a sign yeah, our words reality. are creating things that we and can't see our, yet. our words they our words when we say words the words the words broken down it's a numerical pattern and that pattern creates a geometrical shape so uh, that's what the jinn It's also right? very interesting just so you know the last verse of Sutul Jinn the last verse mm -hmm. Allah generally Allah says in Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir but in Sutul Jinn Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a very special way of saying it he says wa uh, wa kulli shay'in adada and Allah encompasses all the numbers Ah subhanallah wa kulli shay'in adada you can look that up uh, just to be sure uh, yeah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in the last verse of Sutul Jinn. Yeah. Uh, also in Sutul Kahf, those of, that, of us that have been studying it would notice that Allah subhanahu wa aala keeps talking about calculation. Mm. Which is generally for hisab. Yeah. Hisab means hisab, mathematics yeah. and numbers. Okay. Right? So there is a relationship between numbers, hisab, and the end times. Mm. Because yeah, the Christians say that God is a mathematical God. I mean, I don't know how how accurate that is a statement, or how much how we can say that. Well, in Allah ala kulli shayin qadir, qadr means to give something in measurement. Right. Right. So if in Allah ala, some people have said in Allah ala kulli shayin qadir is the name of Allah. It's like one full name, mm -hmm. like Malikul Mulk. It's just a, it's a compound of words, but the the word the the name is one, like one title. You can mm -hmm. say. In Allah ala kulli shayin qadir is like a title of Allah for sure, and uh, meaning Allah describes Himself in that way. There's no doubt about this. And then that uh, in Allah ala Allah is over all things. He puts a measurement, meaning there is a mathematical formula for everything, right? Right. And also, uh, Sheikh, um, how many uh, days did, does Allah subhanahu wa taala said He created the days in? Yeah, was, was uh, seven seven days, right? And uh, six days. Th no, six days. And the seventh day is the day of judgment. Yeah, and so why would he say that? In a, in, sorry, Brother Imran, I just have to make this point. Go ahead. Go ahead check go ahead. In, in the seventh, seventh day is the day of judgment, right? And uh, in verse seven of Surah Rahman, Allah, Allah says, He has raised heaven and imposed the balance of justice. So do not, why, why, what does Allah say? He has imposed this balance. Don't transgress that balance. So balance, mm -hmm. once again, it's like a pre precision, calculation. So we must not transgress that thing, that what Allah has put. It's kind of like riba, where one plus one becomes three. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Where you're transgressing the balance. Mm -hmm. Right? And so, uh, anyway. Well, on, on, the, on that note of balance, um, what he mentioned, what uh, Brother Sadi mentioned. So verse seven, eight, and nine. Allah mentions balance three times in a row, al mizan. Hmm. Yeah. So there, th that that's what gives us more uh, confirmation who Allah is referring to in this surah. The people hmm. who upset the balance of yes, of course, yes, okay. yeah. that's a very good point. Are, yeah, right. Um, yeah, and on on that. So uh, basically, when he's speaking about even the skies. Uh, is it skies? What is it? Uh, what's yeah. The Somebody's word? trying to block out the sun. You know, he's going to yeah, try exactly, to upset the balance. Exactly. Yeah, but I mean, I'd go even even further than that. It seems as though Allah is saying, and when Allah says wasama, what was it? Wasama rafaaha. It seems as though Allah is saying, why would Allah, if Allah is describing how perfectly He created everything, why would Allah raise the skies? You know, would it be for our reach? Yeah, that's 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 what it seems like when we look at it in the context of these people who are shooting up in the sky, trying to uh, go where they're clearly not supposed to go, trying to break boundaries or limits, as they say, and um, you know going beyond. Um, yeah, it just seems like uh, these are the people. Who are the people who've always led this? The making of the plane. But, um, I'm not saying that planes are haram. But it just seems like that we've all gone along thinking that this is the progression of humanity whilst they do all of these things. But it's, if you look at who's been behind all of this, you know, it just seems like it's these same people, the people of 13, who are doing this because they're trying to challenge, you know, the Challenger, the Titanic, the whatever it is, Apollo 13, everything you look at is from... Apollo uh, 13. Yeah, yeah, NASA, NASA who 
you know, obviously it's a debate whether it's even a real organization, but we know it's created by the Nazis, right? It's created and run by the Nazis that fled, um, that fled Germany and they went to America and they continued with their experimentation through the organization of NASA. Uh, it, come, it comes down to what you said, uh, what you've been teaching us, the manufacturers. This is what Allah is referring to, the manufacturers, because Allah created everything in order. Everything is a nature. It's, it's in cycles. It's in numbers. But these people, they change Allah's creation and make it something. So that's that's why I want to uh, show you verse 33, because verse uh, what Brother Always was saying about uh, space travel. And uh, we know who are behind this agenda of uh, going to Mars is the Freemasons, basically. And how many degrees do they have? They have 33 degrees. Mm -hmm. And uh, 33 is a significant number. And in verse 33, Allah is telling us that, yeah, Which means... Imran, can you go to that verse, please? Imran. Uh... And in, in, in verse number 33, Allah is talking about space travel and the people who are behind space travel. And these are these are the alliance of jinn and shaitan once again. Allah is exposing their plans because the entirety of the revolution of physics, engineering, has been this uh, desire to go past this earth and set up colonies in Mars or something. And it also connects yeah, to that hadith. Yeah. It also connects to that hadith where Allah says uh, the Ya'juj and Ma'juj will shoot arrows in the sky and the arrows will come back with blood. So we know these are not literal arrows because how can they do that? It has to be missile technology. So they're going to I wonder the ayah of the Quran that says Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa is partly saying stay on earth. Don't try to escape. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Which verse? But it's in verse in al Baqarah. But He's the one who created whatever is on the earth for you. Now there is a verse that says, He's put in your control whatever is in the heavens, not heavens, uh, whatever is in the heavens and the earth. Uh, but majority of the time, the focus is on the earth. Like for example, Sutul Mulk, uh, you know, Allah made the earth for you like a tamed animal. So the emphasis is, to stay on it's very interesting that when, uh, because if you take the ideas of Malik bin Nabi, who is one of the greatest scholars, he says the mu'min is always looking up, right? And the, the, the disbeliever is always looking to like kind of like harness nature and the power of nature. Like he's looking, looking down. Uh, but, but what happens in, in the end is actually kind of like the opposite. opposite yeah. The moment is uh, he keeps his eyes on the ground in the sense of, but he's always contemplating about the top, right? Mm. And, and what they're doing is they're trying to escape Mm. Like go into the heavens in order to have control of the earth. Flip. Shake, but the believer flip. looks at flip. the earth yes, and the humble, flip. you know, walking on the earth and uh, the servants of Allah walk on the earth in a humble way. So they're humble on earth, but they contemplate on the top. Yeah, They want to dominate the earth, like uh, take out the resources and then escape the Heavens. Anyway, it's a side point. So no, 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 no. It's a very important point because this is why th there's so many levels to this, and I don't even think we'll be able to cover it today. Yeah, but yeah. there's so many levels to this. Why it gives us more confidence of who Allah is addressing in this surah, and one of them is what you just mentioned there about how it's kind of reversed. Everything is reversed, and this is the theme that we kind of found as we were studying that everything seems to be inversed, reverted, flipped. And it's the way Allah goes through the beginning of Surah Rahman, showing us all of these graces that Allah has, you know, given us. And then before, yeah, just as we reach verse 13, it's like as if then these people are mentioned about those who are reversing everything, those who are flipping everything, those who are doing the opposite, inverting everything. That, that yeah, so I mean, um, what is it that gives us more... If anyone thinks, uh, uh, Bismillah, uh, Sheikh, can you yes. hear me? 
Yes. Uh, now in uh, Surah al Juma, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions that, uh, he said that uh, it is he who raised a messenger among the people who had no scripture to recite his revelations. The yeah. reason I'm bringing this up is because we do talked about met methodology, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he links, uh, basically, he says that uh, he is the one who raised for the illiterate people a messenger from among themselves, reciting to them his revelations, purifying mm -hmm. them, and teaching them the book and wisdom, for indeed they have, they had previously be, previously been clearly astray, mm -hmm. along with others of them who have not yet joined them in faith, for he is the Almighty, all wise. And then he mentions, this is the favor of Allah. Basically, he links his favor with scripture, knowledge, wisdom, and the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, uh, so I brought that up. And then after that, he mentions uh, that uh, the example of those who were interested in observing the Torah, like the Jews, basically. Uh, but mm. they failed. To do yes, that. exactly. Yes. So they are basically the people of Turkey and everything. They They are not Jews, obviously, and uh, Christians, but they portray as that. And there are the Satanists, but uh, he mentions that uh, right after that, uh, say, O Prophet, O Jews, if you, if you claim to be Allah's chosen people out of all humanity, then wish for death if what you say is true. Mm. But they will never wish that because of what their hands have done. And Allah has perfect knowledge of wrongdoers. Mm -hmm. The reason I brought it up is because you mentioned about the methodology and uh, how we we were talking about uh, taking the number uh, thirty one and uh, implying that, and uh, basically I linked that with the uh, favors of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala from another surah in Surah Al Jumma. So Allah links, so Allah talks about favor continuously. Which favor of your favor of your Lord do you deny? Which one? So. He repeats that 31 times. And in Surah al Juma basically he says, uh, he links one of his favors as scripture, knowledge, the Prophet وسلم, among a people who are illiterate. And then he goes to talk about the Jews, you know, about those who claim to be the chosen people of Allah SWT. Because these people of 14, they seriously think that they're actually doing something good. Some of them, some of them know they're doing bad. And some of them actually think they're serving God and they're doing a noble job. So I just wanted to link that to the Surah of uh, Surah Rahman. I think that's they part said, of the uh, yeah. What Brother Abdullah just said, I, would, I just want to build on it. He said some of these people who think they're doing right. And that's very interesting because that starts at 13. Because at the pyramid, uh, Brother Abdullah, mute your mic. It's echoing. At the top is Shaitan. And then you have the Magi who are, who are here since the time of Musa. So Shaitan and the Magi, they know for a fact that what they're doing is evil. But after the Magi is the 13 families, the 13 bloodlines. These are the ones who believe that they're doing what they're doing a right thing. So it starts from 13 families, the conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. and it, so from from it starts from 13 families, and that's when it's flipped because these people they think they're doing something right, but they're doing evil. So the flipping starts at that stage the principle of flip and also yeah. um also on that note um the way they flipping it their main tactic is fear like you can they, you know anybody can say whatever they want but shaitan has divine uh right to your thoughts and so mm -hmm. fear is where he gets you and then if you and you know we're talking about the two evil uh communities humans and jinn I mean, if you go to Surah Jinn, verse 13, what does it say? It talks about fear. So this solidifies uh, what we're talking about. I don't yeah. know if this has anything to do with it, but something you might want to look into. Surah Al-Muntahina has 13 verses. And one of the things special about it, it has the word Allah in every verse. It's the only Surah in the Quran that has the word Allah in every verse. Oh, Surah Al-Muntahina has 13 verses. So which number Surah is that? Uh, it comes right before Sutu Saf and Sutu Jama. Uh, what verse? Might want to double check. Yeah. yeah, it has thirteen verses. Yeah, it has. And the 13. word Allah is in every verse. And this is a very special verse about the basically, if you go into depth of this uh, surah, it is about how 
Hezbollah Shaitan and Hezbollah work differently. Mm. The party of Allah. Look at the 13th verse. It's the two parties, yeah. It's the two parties again. Sheikh, look at the 13th verse. Oh my God. Look at the 13th verse. Oh my God. It says it's it, Allah is reminding them that uh, do not make alliances with whom Allah doesn't like. Allah is angry. Mm. Uh, so book, it's remind bookmark this. Bookmark this. Uh, I save this one. So yeah. Allah is reminding them, them of alliance, not mm. forbidden alliances. And mm. forbidden alliances are the beginning of denying Allah's blessing. And mm. that's where the flip happens. That's when the so flip starts. Mm. On Allah. Yeah, yeah, it's when you think other people can benefit you. Mm. And you're not uh, taking the benefit from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. Uh, Trying to create your own rules. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, so, yeah, that's something you might want to look into. Yeah, no, definitely. So when we go, yeah, when we think about the people of 13, I think of, yeah, exactly. Uh, great. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, so, yeah, that's something you might want to look into. Yeah, no, definitely. So... When we go, yeah, when we think about the people of 13, I think of, yeah, exactly, uh, great timing. That symbol, what is that? UN symbol, yeah? This is the this is the UN. This is the World Health Organization. This is China's National Space Administration logo. Yeah. Uh, this is... Hold, the, is hold, hold this, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hold, and hold then this is NASA. And then the reason why they have this, I mean, this is just my opinion, the reason why they have this red little symbol, it looks like a snake's tongue, right? Oh, yes. And so they always have yeah. to, they always, I mean, to me, the snake represents Iblis. So they're, they're, it's like they're Serpent. praying to me in a sense, right? Yep. They're showing, they're showing who, he, who their master really is. Bro, that is the serpent split tongue. That is it. Yeah. I've never seen, I've never noticed that. You've just showed me right now. Yeah. So subhanAllah, you know, yeah. if, we, if this is why this group is so good is because we take the Quran and we we're holding on to it and we are not saying that oh maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying this no he is saying this mm -hmm. and we need to show our sheikh and we need to see his perspective yeah. and yeah. like you're yeah. what you just that surah with a verse 13 is just like, it just makes it more strong our point right yeah po po point to those leaves the leaves on the UN symbol yeah. uh, the reef yeah, this one this Sheikh, one, yeah. are you are you aware of this I mean uh, to me Sutul Muntahina is important but to me that ayah number 103 uh, mm -hmm. Because it relates specifically to magic and occult, right. is even more uh, interesting. Yeah, which it's, is uh, this, it's more basically. it's more interesting because uh, also like it, there's no it's not no coincidence that it's one o three zero has no value so if yes, you take out the exactly, zero it's exactly. one and three That's right. is thirteen. That's right. It, it, that will be a stretch for some people, but yeah, you're right. Uh, also, I think so. Yeah. Just yeah, one so last thing for me is a um, reef. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, these these wreaths here, Sheikh, they have they have thirteen, like two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, and then one over here. That's thirteen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in here, there's thirty-two little rectangles, and then there's one in the middle. Meaning thirty-three. Right? Thirty-three. So okay. thirty. So three plus three equals six. So it's an obsession with the number six. My opinion is is because they have to try to be like Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. He created the heavens and earth in six days, so yeah. they're trying to replicate that. Yeah. And so six is a very it, it's. I mean, maybe I'll just say it. Ar Rahman, six letters, Sheikh. Mm. So you want this is this is my interpretation. This is the Islamic six six six. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created the heavens and earth in six days. Uh, Ar Rahman. Or oh, sorry, I should say it like this. Ar Rahman is six letters. His mercy created the heavens and earth in six days for us to believe in his six beliefs in Iman. Mm. Yeah, and okay. uh, Abdullah, brother Abdullah, he found something that was quite interesting as well about the six. Uh, what was it? The six electrons. What was it? The human is made of six. Right. Six electrons. Six. The thing was that uh, all uh, everything around us. Basically, the structure of uh, carbon. That's it. Carbon. Uh, uh, it's six, six, six. Yeah. Yeah, carbon. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I didn't hear that. I couldn't hear. Sure, your voice. No, basically, no, yeah. this connection. Basically, basically yeah. So uh, we're carbons. made of. Yeah, go on, yeah. Basically, all uh, all living organic matter is made up of carbon. Carbon is what. Carbon. Yes. Water. Yes. That's right. Yes. And carbon has. By the way, there's six. a relationship between carbons and genes also. I just haven't figured out. Okay. Exactly what? 
but uh, you know the 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 food of the jinns is dung, for example, in bones. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, filth, and, filth and of any sort. Dung, really, dung right? is mainly mainly carbon. And then you have like the skull and bones, for example. Yeah. So um, they feed off they feed off us. They feed off carbon. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, what is it? The Roman uh, that wreath that's around the UN symbol, uh, the thirteen leaves. Um, what is that? That's the Roman. Uh, it's the Roman Empire's wreath, right? I don't know if you're it's, familiar with that. It's this. This I my interpretation is this. From from learning from Doctor Zaid Omar, he's mm -hmm. saying that the crescent moon is the people of Habil or Kabil or Kabil, right? And so this is what this is. This is the, this is the crescent moon. Is just, is just re-edited, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. they have to use these numbers like this is a part of their magic yeah uh, and after reading surah rahman and after seeing all these symbols i have come to the conclusion that the future is now that the muslims should be looking into space meaning keeping our eyes on the people who are obsessed with space with space travel and space technology uh, because in verse 33 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does says um, about space right and when he withdraws his authority you better watch out. Yeah. Okay, I, just wanna, I just want to read something I wrote about uh, verse 33 because of what Brother Iman just said about uh, space. So in verse 33, Allah tells them, O oh, alliance of human beings and jinn, if you are in case you are able to penetrate the regions of the heavens and the earth, then do so, then do so, but you will not, you will not penetrate them except with my authority. So Allah is telling them, if you want to do so, you can, but you should not. I don't allow you to. And me, I have, I have written something like uh, Allah both exposes and reminds this alliance of humans and jinns of their plans of Star Wars and Space Wars. The entire progress of physics and engineering has been a race to travel to space in order to establish colonies in other planets as well as to contact alien civilizations. But there is a more sinister context to this plot. To In fact, to that's space. kind of like the the new religion, right? The state yeah. religions, the religion of the WHO and UN. It's like this: we have to contact the other. That's like that's become their. Yep. Kind of like end U goal. UN religion, yeah. UN one world religion. <coughs> and so oh, I was, yeah. yeah. There is something. There is something about space that connects with. Uh, check, check, check. Uh, I mean, uh, I found a new connection actually recently. So I'll just uh, finish on that and then you further screen. Yeah, so it's on. like yeah. uh, uh, the new connection that I've made is there is actually a more sinister reason that they're so obsessed with space. And uh, I was reminded of this when Brother Iman asked a question to you one shift that uh, has Iblis, has, has, does he have the same journey as the Prophet? Has he made the journey of Isra or Miraj or something? So I, I did some research and uh, uh, what I found is that the people of the occult, their number one priority to go to space is because they believe Iblis being thrown out of Jannah was a mistake. So they want to mm. travel and put Iblis back on Jannah. So yeah. for this... Door. They're finding a back door. They're yeah. finding a back door. So for or this trying. reason, the alliance of humans and jinns is predicated on returning Iblis to heaven via ascending this planet and there's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari which which validates this view it states that Ya'juj and Ma'juj will send missiles to the sky and those missiles will return with blood and after seeing that blood they will say we killed everyone on the earth and now we have killed everyone in Jannah so this exposes their mission to kill everyone in uh, to like send missiles and kill the angels. Kill I've had angels. conversations with jinns in which jinns have told me exactly what you've said. Oh, so in fact, uh, uh, let me just uh, to tell you of uh, two, maybe two or three uh, different conversations. One of the conversations was that you have been lied to. Mm -hmm. See, the angel, I'm giving you their narrative. One of the, I don't know, you know, what rank or what, uh, but it's interesting and anyhow but you have been lied to. It's the angels that are bad and it is we that are actually good. And clearly Allah is unjust because why else is there misery? Why else was Iblis kicked out? 
uh, why else is you know uh, everything happening? It's happening because Shaitan is the one, or the Iblis is the one who's actually on the right side, mm -hmm. and the angels and Jibrail and Mikail they're on all on the wrong side, and they've put you on this world just to create misery because mm -hmm. they just like to watch you in misery and laugh. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's exactly what you kind of get in the universities, just in, mm -hmm. maybe in a different way. Yeah, okay? yeah. The same narrative, which I found very interesting because being, you know, from the university setting and then now talking to Shaitan <laughs> or this, uh, this kind of like Shaitan Jinn, and he's telling me everything that I kind of like the same conclusions that they have in the university. I'm like, oh, okay, this is very interesting, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I have had many discussions with the Jinns uh, on the for example if, uh, adam being made forced or sorry iblis being forced to bow down to adam and how that was unjust mm. this is a very very common theme mm. uh, another thing i've seen is that when jinns will argue with me they will say something like you're just mud right you're just like mm. mud. They're going back to that whole yeah. uh, thing made of clay right and uh, and 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 there, there's so much on this whole issue of jinns and understanding jinns. Is, that's also another important topic. Mm -hmm. Understanding Rukia and what's happening with the jinns and why people are not getting cured from Rukia nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, all these are important. They're all interrelated. Uh, basically, uh, yeah, they're all interrelated. Yeah, so, all, yeah. so on, the, on the UN, the, uh, the reason why, if you go back to that symbol, uh, the UN um, with that reef with 13. It seems like as if they are the leading organization today that are leading all of these groups, wherever they are, whether it's the East or the West, however, however many small factions of these people there are, it seems like they are all following the song of the UN, right? Mm -hmm. If there was one place where all of the hymn sheets are coming out from for them to all play along, it seems like it's the UN. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. And and uh, so if that's the place where it's all coming from, it seems as though we all are are aware of Agenda Twenty One, Agenda Twenty Thirty. Yeah, yeah, we're aware of that. Yeah, what their plan is to take control of everything. And so again, what gives us more confidence about who Allah is referring to in Surah Rahman is when you look at from verse, from verse, what is it? Yeah, basically you can just start from the very beginning. Um, uh, from verse 1, Allah is most gracious. They clearly mm. are rebelling to that, that mm. Allah is most gracious. Number 2. Yeah, the, I mean, the whole modern world, the yeah. denial of God is predicated on Allah is not Rahman. Therefore, yeah, he doesn't exactly. exist. Exactly, he's not, yeah. So they're saying he's, God's not good, right? Yeah. So, Number so two. this is the, verse, the whole premise verse, of modern thought. Western yeah, verse thought. 2, he created, verse 2, he created, I mean, he taught the Quran, yeah? Yeah. Uh, what are they trying to do? They're trying, basically, even if it's through our ulama, like Dr. Omar Zaydan showed us, they have tried to shut down our access to this Quran. Yeah. All right. If you look at verse number three, he created man. Uh, you know, I mean, just sand. imagine the people on top who read the Quran and know that there is something special here because of the numberology or the symbolism, mm -hmm. how much they would be interested in that. Yeah, people yeah. don't find out. I mean, about just it. the words alone will keep you busy forever. But now the numbers are just uh, seems like it's a whole nother, um, another, I don't know how to put it, another language within yeah, the yeah, language. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, verse number three, uh, he created man. What are they doing? They're trying to do transhuman. Yeah, they're trying to create the robot man, whatever you want to call it. Verse number four, Allah, Allah taught us uh, the speech. You know, it's, I don't think it's by chance that Allah put it that early in Surah Rahman that he taught us the speech. Obviously, our words are so powerful. And today, what are we all being faced with? Why are people resorting to you, Sheikh, you know, for your telegram groups? Because we are being shut down. Our mouths, the truth is being shut down. So, you know, it's no wonder the speaking of the true words. Again, UN Agenda 21, the censorship, uh, verse number five. Uh, the moon, the sun, as you're aware, Bill Gates, what he's trying to do with the sun. Uh, verse number six. Um, what is it? The stars, the trees. Um, yeah, they're playing with those. Everything you look at, you can flip it and you can see that they're messing with everything that Allah is listing here in Surah mm -hmm. Rahman at the beginning. All of what Allah has graced us with, it, you can basically just reverse it and see 
that that is exactly what is happening. Verse number seven, the heavens. Um, and then it's confirmed further in verse eight, again, a verse seven, eight, nine, that this is the balance that they are messing with. Agenda 21, they're trying to take over everything. So yeah, I just wanted to make that point that it's leading up to even verse 13, that how you look at it, you realize. Right, so it's leading up to verse 13. Yeah, yes. leading up to verse 13 <coughs> makes you kind of even more confident that Allah is speaking to these people who are completely reversing everything that Allah has gifted us with, even the wide expansive earth. Which one is the wide expansive earth? Um, the wide expansive earth is verse number... Which one is that? Uh, 10, verse number 10. 10, yeah. And even that. So again, they're doing the opposite to us. What are they doing? Lockdown. Keep you in a box. Keep you in a prison. Allah has created this wide expansive earth. Uh, they're trying to cram us all into the cities. They're trying to, even within the cities, cram us into these boxes. So everything can, seems to be interpreted as, as we get to verse 13. That Allah has given us all this. And we have no idea about any of this. We're not touching any of this. We're not experiencing any of this. They're restricting us from all of this. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. I, would like I, to, I would like to know your uh, interpretation of verse number 17 because uh, Allah says he is the uh, Lord of the two Easts and the two Wests. So yeah, for me, so, uh, I'm no scholar, I'm just a guy who studies. And uh, for me, this uh, verse 17, I deduced that uh, only in a round earth is two east and two west possible. In a flat surface, if the earth was flat, you have one east and one west. And in a flat earth, the entire eastern earth would have daytime at the same time, and the entire western earth would have day at the same time. Only in a globe is it possible that me in Malaysia, it's day, in Saudi, it's east, in the UK, it's uh, night, in Canada, it's uh, morning. So in a flat earth, this is not possible. The spherical, uh, so in my opinion, this is evidence of, of the earth being a sphere. And uh, the laws of physics are also based on uh, the earth being a round shape. What do you think of this? Sure. I think the earth is global. I mean, they're, they're yeah, round, yeah, spherical. And, and for I've me, it's very, this debate. Uh, you know, it's the, the moon is round, the sun is round, the stars are round. I think we're, what we're on is round. So, yeah, it's because uh, Sheikha, uh, I have seen a lot of Muslims, uh, even in our groups, a lot of them believe that the earth is flat. And they, See, the, they, the, the, the thing that they will get us on, right, on the conspiracy theories is by these types of, because they will always throw out exactly. something that's falsehood in that's the it. conspiracy the theory truth, yeah. world. They yeah. will throw out these things, even with coronavirus, they will throw something out yeah. where you're mixed with truth and falsehood. And then they'll point out the falsehood part of it, then debunking the whole thing yeah. in order to debunk the whole thing. Yeah. So uh, we have to be very careful. You know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stood Baqarah in the very beginning, you know, uh, Don't uh, can mix the batin with the haqq. Mm -hmm. And that is what is uh, happening. And it's happening the other way around. That is that they give to the people something of the haqq but inside is batil, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of, kind of like the Qadiani fitna of the uh, Prophet Muhammad being the last prophet or not. They give the people that they do da'wah because they convert a lot of people. So they do da'wah and tawheed, which is true. Once they buy the idea of tawheed, then they tell them, okay, this is the last prophet, right? So they give, they, uh, so, so the, so it's the mixing of the haq. In fact, uh, Dr. Sahmud used to say that there's no such thing as batil alone, meaning batil cannot stand on. It needs something true to stand mm, on. Yeah, I, I remember reading that. You said that. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Right? Batil needs something true to stand on. So batil will always borrow from the truth. Mm, and which is what is, they're doing. Which is what they're doing. They're doing. They yeah. will always borrow something from the truth to mm. build their batil around it. Mm. Majority of the science is true. Yeah, a lot of the science is true. Um, yeah, but on that verse 17, um, so could it also, you know, the, is it that Allah... As far uh, as verse 17 is concerned, uh, I can only say what uh, Sheikh Sha'arawi has written in his tafsir. It's very interesting. And I haven't 
thought, meaning they're different tafsirs, but particularly Sheikh Sha'rawi uh, has some, he's combined all of these different verses about the East and the West, right? So for example, you have Rabbul Mashariq, Rabbul Mashriqaini wa Rabbul Maghribain, the two East, the two West, but sometimes it's in the singular, right? Rabbul Mash, so for example, in Sutta Taha, Taha, Ma Anzalna Alaykum Al-Qur'ana Li Tashqa, Tanzeelam Mimman Khalaq al Tanzeelam Mimman Khalaq Al-Arda Wa Al-Samawat Al-Ula Ar-Rahman Wa Ala Al-Arsh Istawa Lahu Ma Fi Al-Samawat Wa Ma Fi Al-Ardi Wa Ma Bainahuma Wa Ma Tahta Al-Thara Wait, Allahumma Salli Ala Muhammad But anyway, Rabbul Mashariq also comes And then you have See here فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِرَبِّ الْمَشَارِكِ وَالْمَغَارِبِ So here it's in the plural Okay so there are many Easts, many West, but Rabbul Mashriqaini wa Rabbul Maghribain, you have that over here so, if you look. So right? does verse 17 mean two Easts and two Wests, or does it mean one East and one West? No, it means Rabbul Mash... Uh, Mashrika, show me the verse again and I will tell you based upon the Arabic. Yeah. Uh, Rabbul Mashriqaini wa Rabbul Maghribain, right? Mashriqain mm -hmm. is plural. It's not plural, two. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's plural. So could that mean? Sometimes it says Maghribain. Sometimes it says Rabbul Mashriqin. Mashriqin, mm -hmm. uh, uh, for example, in Surah Rahman, it's in plural. Uh, Rabbul Mashriqi. Now this is plural. Wal Maghribi. Right? Rabbul Mashriqi wal Maghribi. It also means that, I mean, there's two E's, meaning there's Rabbul Mashriqi wal Maghribi. Now, Rabbul Mashriqin, Rabbul Mashriqi wal Maghribi is in the singular in Sutul Muzammil. Al Mashriq, Al Maghrib, the East, the West. So now the question became why does it sometimes come in dual, sometimes in plural, sometimes in singular, right? So that depends upon which uh, plane of existence you're looking from. Well, if, if, we, if we use the when lens it, that we've been when using. It, when it's talking about from the earth, it's generally either plural or dual. But anyway, this is a longer conversation. We should look into this. Yeah. But uh, different words are used for this. Now, every planet has its own east and its west. Mm -hmm. Every galaxy has its east and west. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There is the uh, the sun that rises in the uh, the summer time versus the sun that rises in the uh, the winter time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the sun's positioning changes according to the seasons. Also. Also, and Sheikh, so, um... so there's two major ones. The two you can say the extremes, and then everything in the middle. So those are the two the duality, mm -hmm. and then there's the general, which is singular, right? The mm -hmm. east or the west. But there's the duality of where the sun uh, rises mm -hmm. from, let's say, in the summer and then in the winter, which is why we have the, 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 the change in the time zone, I believe. Then you have, uh, there's an east and west for every planet, for every system, for every yes. situation, right? Um, so, so this is a kind of a, how some of the scholars have looked at it. Now, well, Chef, do you think it's just simply... Um, in the context of the surah that he's talking about the two east the two west meaning the, the one west for the humans and yes. the other west for the jinn and the that's one west for the humans because they don't have night and day like us right like they don't i'm not sure but i'm pretty sure that they don't have the specific times of humans do right they have their own uh calculations i can't say time. based upon the hadith but or actually a verse of quran does confirm this now that i'm thinking about it they do have night and day the way we do but it's different but, in the different. sense they're more active in the night and they sleep in the day. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't, to, yeah. the jinns generally don't like sunlight. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, similar the to what Imran generally. was saying, uh, uh, it looks like if we're looking at it from the lens of the people of 13, now again, see this is where we need you, Sheikh. Are we, uh, am I making this up or does it look like that? If you're looking at it from the lens of the people of 13, what do we know that they do? Where do they draw their power from? Where do so, they for example, power? about night and day with Shaytan, for example, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا خَلَقْ وَمِنْ شَرِّ غَاسِقٍ إِذَا وَقَبْ When the night comes, and it's referred to specifically in terms of evil, also the Prophet saying, bring in your children after Maghrib, right? So you're bringing in your children after Maghrib, there's a protection in that. So mm -hmm. they're more active. And the Muslim jinns I've talked to, uh, they seem to try to live their life according to the day and night the way we do. Mm -hmm. The Muslim jinns. 
the non-Muslim jinns become more active in nighttime. Wow. Mm. Mm, interesting. So, so is it not possible that two Easts could be the East of the unseen and the East of the seen? And the two West can. could be? Yeah? Yes, of course it can. Mm. It could also be all, all meanings, you know, because the Quran is multidimensional. So it's, uh, yes, of course it can mm. be. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. And is, is it any coincidence that Surah Falak is um, Surah number 113? <laughs> <I> just... <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, yeah. Endless. This, is, this is where we get uh, into a conversation where it doesn't stop. But uh, going back to Surah Rahman, um, now because I've been on so this. So, one of the so things long, that's interesting in terms of this, right, by these many different correlations that you've established, is something in, in Islamic law called Modul uh, Wahdaniya, meaning uh, the oneness of a subject. Right, mm -hmm. or what can be called the coherence of the subject. So it's not just in Surah Rahman, it's also in Surah Baqarah, it's also in Surah Jamaah, it's also here. And you can see this kind of like overall uh, synchronicity of a subject, uh, yeah. which is uh, really the ultimate proof of anything, right? It's not in just one place, it's, it's, it is a common theme you can see across the board within mm -hmm. the Quran itself. And, and so, and, and when you come to a point, you're like, yeah, yeah, well, we're just going to find this non-endingly. That's when you know a person has Iman, right? That's like Iman because you just now know, right? Mm -hmm. Because Iman is not just belief. It's actually, actually a form of knowledge that gives you that light to just know something. Yeah. So, so check to yes. add uh, yeah, yeah. that, uh, you know, uh, in Surah Rahman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Mizan, the balance. Yeah, And when it comes to the brain also, I mentioned that earlier about the division of the brain. The balance have been uh, disrupted. Yes, I totally believe that. Totally, totally, totally. Check, you know, on the number 55, Surah Rahman, yeah. the, thing, the thing that gives, uh, again, more confidence is the Christians say that the number five symbolizes God's grace. Yeah, they say that. Oh. Five okay, symbolizes God's grace. So the same people that are teaching us that 13 represents rebellion are the same people that are saying that the number five represents grace and, uh, sorry, God's grace. And 55 is a representation of expounded intensity in, in God's grace. Mm. If five represents God's grace, they're saying that 55 is what is it they say? It symbolizes the intensity of the grace that God has for all his creation. This mm. is what the Christians are saying about the number 55. And, and look Surah at what 55 Surah, yeah. is Surah Rahman. And Surah Rahman, exactly. So, you know, whether people want to believe about these numbers or not, it seems to match. Wherever What's you Ayah 55 of Surah Rahman? Yes, that would be interesting. That would be interesting. Um, Let's go check it out. So which one of your favorites? Oh, you wow. Wait. Yeah, yeah. So it's the same thing. Yeah. If we want to see the biggest example. So it's going for both groups, right? But, but yeah. is it possible that we could So you have the 55 experts. on the one side who are Sheikh. not going to deny it. Sheikh, mm. Sheikh, look, you at, have both look, sides. At, look at 56. If you want to see what Allah's biggest grace upon us is, could it be that verse? 56? That's the beginning of it, right? That's the beginning of the... Or no, no. That's the first thing a man wants. Yeah. Yeah, women. I mean, <laughs> let, let's, let's, let's be real. Um, so, yeah, 55. If you want to look at what Allah's biggest grace upon us is, it, it looks like it's... If it's not that verse, then it's around that verse. And if I'm honest, if I'm totally honest, yeah, that is what everyone wants, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. actually, you know what? That's that's so true because the Prophet until they change your like, until they change your nature and you're like one of those asexual people that doesn't, matter, <laughs> which is what's happening now. Yeah. Uh, inshallah, we'll remain the way we yeah. are created. Yeah. We will. We will get it. Inshallah. Inshallah, we will increase. But I, I have to uh, leave you, brothers. Now I have to pray Maghrib. So okay. forgive me. Yeah, we're, we're, I think we're wrapping up soon anyway, inshallah. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, well,
take care and give yeah. salam uh, to your family from me, Sheikh. Inshallah, inshallah. Allahu Akbar. And, and so I think uh, this should have been a presentation to the whole group. Well, I know, but we have to gain we have to gain our confidence. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and yes, we, you have my and confidence. we weren't and we weren't sure that you know we were actually doing the right thing because I mean we're not. No, scholars. no, this is awesome. Yeah, I and think so, like, this is just this is honestly, Sheikh, this is just a, like an, a tip of the iceberg. Like I haven't even yeah, gone yeah. In, even the first verse and the, the second verse is I think the most important. It's more. It's not has Allah taught the Quran. It's how does He teach the Quran? And then this third verse, He created man. How did He create man? It's so beautiful, mashallah. And then the fourth verse is like you know eloquent speech. It's the manners. It's how. It, this is exactly why Abdullah. MashaAllah, I love him so much. It's he has this eloquent speech that I am so attracted to because it is the manners of the Prophet. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to say that um, you know, going through all this information, um, it really has made me understand how does the en enemy really work and what knowledge does the enemy really have? And how yeah. is the enemy so successful? How are they able to do the things they're able to do? How are they so connected? And it's and it's very simple. It's natural law. This is how they're doing it. This natural that's, law. That's what they believe in. Yes. And yeah. this is something that I've learned with uh, watching Mark Passio. He's he's an ex Satanist, and he's he literally gave up all their information. And so um, I didn't you know, know some he was of these, an ex Satanist. Okay. Yeah. So he was an ex Satanist, and then he he finally figured out you know these people are psychopaths and they're gonna ruin the world. I better smarten up and teach people what they're trying to do so we can stop them. But you know, some of this stuff that the Muslim Ummah needs to know, they mm. need to know. They can't, uh, like, for example, he uses gravity as an example, right? Meaning, if a little girl is standing on the cliff of the edge and you stand there and you make dua, 100 years, that kid, when that child falls off the cliff, she is going to die regardless. Natural law. Right? This is natural law. This is something that it doesn't, it doesn't matter about your belief. Your belief means nothing. And so well, they, uh, you, uh, Allah can uh, yeah, change it because uh, Ibrahim Salam, it. did not get burned by one of the elements and one of the elements is fire. But, right. but Allah has imposed this balance, which is natural. And he says not to transgress this balance. So, mm -hmm. oh, Allah, on that Allah, note, on that note. Yes, please. Yeah, finish it. I want to speak on that transgressing the balance. So Allah, uh, Allah does change it for his wali, for his... Uh, for the servants he loves, like Prophet Muhammad is a human being. He cannot uh, uh, travel to unseen realms just by himself. But Allah chose him as his wali. And Allah took him on the Isra wa Miraj, a miraculous journey. Allah, uh, Allah gave Isa salam, many uh, abilities which transgress natural law. But Allah tells us it's not for you to transgress. In verse 33, Allah says, do not. But if we want to change, that's a denial of Allah's blessing, which is natural law. So, so that's all what we should learn. Yeah, no, natural no, law is Allah's blessing. Mm -hmm. And check on verse. Um, so when we were talking about what was it, verse seventeen? Can you go to verse seventeen again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We were talking about the two east and the two wests, and. Again, the reason why I do think it is uh, the unseen and the uh, seen is because what does Allah say afterwards in verse 19? He mm. describes another comparison, it seems. This is what I'm thinking. Yeah. It seems as though Allah is comparing how he separated the seen and the unseen. Very good point, yes. With yes. verse 19, how he separated the two seas, even though they are completely side by side. Yeah, but, and what Allah says in verse 20, but between them is a barrier and they do not mix. And yes. this is what gives yeah, us, this is what gives us more confidence that this is referring to, again, the people of 13 who um, cooperate with the unseen. Uh, Sheikh, this is a symbolic language because uh, Allah says, uh, Allah says he has allowed the seas to merge. Mm. But, but what, uh, Allah is referring to seas as well as he is referring to male, female, right, left, yin, yang, east, west. These cannot merge, but these can come together. Come uh, together. These, these cannot side mix. This cannot yeah. mix, but they can merge. Mm -hmm. So that is what Allah says. Allah creates opposites so that they merge. 
But what uh, shaitan is doing is flipping it. Instead of merging, he's trying to mix it. So that is another uh, defiance of natural law. So yes. I just wanted to show this this one to Sheikh before he goes. Um, yeah, go you know ahead. how we talk about Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created the heavens and earth in six days, right? Mm. What 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 does this look like, Sheikh? What number does that look like? Is this the oh that's the six? Okay, yes. This is the golden ratio. It looks like yes. a six. Yes. Yeah. And so this this is a, this is my. So is the is is this related to the Fabricini numbers? Or yes, this is, it's 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 this is what comes from it. Fibonacci. Okay. 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 Yeah. This is what comes from it. And so the Fibonacci sequence can be, I don't know, I'm not sure if you understand it, but it can be seen everything, everywhere. It actually can be seen in your own hand. Mm. And so I guess it'd be better for me to explain golden ratio in a video and then it's more adaptable. But yeah, the number six um, is comes from, I think, from the golden ratio. This is his favor upon um on mankind and the reason why is because when you make anything a website you make a creation out of anything if you use golden ratio it's going to be the most efficient and the most beautiful right right of course beauty. yes exactly right. so your mind and your attention is going to be focused on this beauty and so once he's got your attention now he can he can go into your mind and he can do whatever he wants because he's got your attention and you've given it, you've, you've kind of let down your guard of like, oh, this is something beautiful. This is something nice. Masha this is Allah. the, and what Sutra Kahaf would call Zina, right? This is the yeah, zina. the beauty. The beauty, beauty. Yeah. Zina tul hayat al dunya. Adornment. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And then so you can see the golden ratio in the, in, the, in the spiral of the galaxies and you can see it in your, even your DNA. And, Allah. you know, and the Muslims, we do it this, we do the tawaf. This is the miracle of Ibrahim alayhi salam is a tawaf and it's a representation of the golden spiral <laughs> and not only that makkah is actually lying on golden on ratio the golden ratio yes yeah. and even actually the verse that talks about ibrahim alayhi salam it's actually a golden ratio verse that like the that the, the the word that it lands on is ibrahim alayhi salam so there is a deep connection there that uh, we're going to make a video on too inshallah but there's, yeah, there's tons of, tons of knowledge that... We yeah, to so to. obviously we, we've been working on this for a while and there's so much in this that we want to turn it into something really good and present, you know, uh, presentable to everyone, uh, a proper document, presentations, videos. Uh, but yeah, we just needed to bounce all of this off you first and see mm. what you think. But I guess Yeah, I think this is amazing. I think yeah. this is um, one of the doors that needs to be opened. But I think, Sheikh, uh, even this this uh, can go out to people, right? And then we can enhance it in the future. Like, we can show yeah, us. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. This, even this, even but this. I, I, I mean, I'd love, the, I'd love the group to see all of this. Oh. You know, yeah. also, also, I wanted to say, um, this is something that, that you know, that Ummah hasn't really done yet. But uh, this is something that I haven't even asked of my brothers. But we should, honestly, we should, we should have a female a part of this. To show the Muslim Ummah that we're not gonna, we're not a part of that, you know, where women have to be completely separate. No, they can be a part of us. They don't have to turn their video on, but they can be a part of us, give us their interpretation because we are pairs, right? Mm. They are the female brain, we are the male brain. And once we have merged together, our opinions are now even greater. Mm. Yeah, I 100% I agree. That, that's, where, yeah. that's where our groups with Sheikh and the classes kind of come together. Merging. Yeah. Merging. Merging. Yeah. So, uh, do you want to upload this video that we're having right now, or are you going to make another one? It sounds like can, the brothers want to use this. So, go ahead. You can use this one. I think. I think. I think for our channel, we're gonna cut and chop can, it uh, up. We're, yeah, uh, we're gonna chop it up, shit. But you can put this one in your uh, channel. It's fine. Yeah, I mean, uh, give me the link, and I'll put it up onto the uh, YouTube channel. Okay, no problem. Once I uh, we finish, I'll I'll pass the recording to to sell me, and then he can send it to you. Yeah, just I think use we transfer or one of those, and then I'll put this up inshallah on YouTube as well as you know, and then I'll send it to the group on the uh, the Telegram. Okay. Yeah, I do want. I, do I want think to this is this is this genius. Sure, yeah. This is I'm yeah. very happy. 
Oh, yeah, exactly. I, have, I have to say, so, so I, I had to, to hear that. I had to hear that. <laughs> check, uh, check. Hear, hearing that from you is like validation for us. It's validation. Because honestly, because, we think we're crazy. I, I, because uh, because uh, yeah. literally, me, always, and Imran, uh, we we actually tell each other, are we? Are we like on the phone? Like, what's happening? But, uh, I'm waiting for someone know. to say. I'm and, waiting for someone to say, how dare you make a mockery of the Quran and look at it like this? I'm and also, uh, you know, it. I've been this holding on to this. For this is completely consistent. It has a very good methodology to it, and we even tried it with the 55. I just said that out of the blue. I yeah. said uh, yeah. that out of the blue just to see. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I think it's it's a very consistent uh, methodology. And this can even be used to, you know, uh, to show the Christians, look, we, we have more in common than... Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Than, exactly. than, than, than and also, think, you know, on, on that, that note, check on that note, that's the number 19. Wow. That's a totally different ball game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because number, yeah, right. number 19, I think it says in Surah Mudassir or... Yes, I can't remember what it says, but, yes. but, it's, but it says that the number 19 is in their books, and it is. It's a part of their prayers of, the, I think, okay. the Jews. Uh, they have 19 duas that they do or something. But I know... Okay, yeah, that's something that we should definitely look into. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, something that really... Yeah, and then taking the parts of the eschatology of the Jewish and the Christian that is similar to us, they should know this. Uh, and that might, you know... Um, because there do seem to be some ahadith that seem to suggest that a lot of people from the West at one point will accept this now. Mm. And, and yeah. that will lead to the West getting an allergic reaction and, and breaking the covenant with us. And kind of like, uh, yeah, so there, there is some something to that. But Sheikh, when it, when it comes to the terminology of Islam and Muslim, uh, is it... Is it labeled to the people of uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu or is it simply as we understand the meaning of the word, mm. those who are in submission to uh, Allah the in the truest sense? So, you know, uh, repeat your question. Okay, basically, it's like when we come across some of these Christians. So, for example, uh, Brother Sadi, he had an interview with Brendan O'Connell, and we were speaking the other day. Who had an interview? Uh, I just want to understand. Uh, uh, Sadi here, yeah. brother Sadi here. Yeah. Yeah, I... Oh, he had an interview. Yeah, he interviewed Brendan O'Connell, basically. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and... yeah, go on. yeah. Go, go I'm ahead. sure he's he's been sought after, probably gone. Yeah. You were going to ask something, Sheikh? Yeah. Oh, no? So, okay. Yeah. So, uh, my question where this, was: Where is this interview? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we're still we're editing. editing. We're editing. Still we're editing. editing. Yeah. Okay, we, 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 we're priming people. <laughs> Brother Sami knows all about the priming. I, I think I'm going to have a look at that interview straight after this, actually. <laughs> so basically, yeah, but basically my question is, we were speaking and um, we were saying, subhanAllah, in these days, we're coming, we're coming across so many people. For, for example, me, when I listen to Anthony Patch, he sounds as Muslim as a Muslim should be. Yes. And even when you speak to Brendan O'Connell, when you look at their spirit, sure, no one's perfect. But when you look at these people and what they're trying to do and what they're looking at, they, they seem to be so much in line with the spirit of Islam. And so, yeah, it just begs the question, who, who is a Muslim today? Who, what, who is following Islam today? You know, so when you say that a lot of people will accept Islam, you know, is it, is it that they will accept, um, you know, um, the, the Islam that we understand as being followers of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or is it those who are just simply in submission to Allah with which, whichever messenger they were sent? Mm, From the Ahadith, it seems like it's the second option because yeah. it's two different camps. But yeah. you beg a very important question. Mm. And that is that, uh, that our Muslims, uh, let me put it this way, right? If you're li living in a non-Muslim system, your banking is not Islamic, your alliances are not Islamic, your politics is not Islamic, the legal laws you have to abide by are not Islamic, what percentage of you is Muslim? Mm. Yeah. Now, number one, versus another person who sees the devil in every, he doesn't see Allah necessarily, which is the mm. Christian eschatology, uh, meaning that they're very aware of the devil, right? And his kind of like uh, the, the antichrist. But a person who has become God, not God, who's become God conscious, mm. he has taqwa. Mm. 
He's not Muslim, but he is taqwa of Allah. He doesn't know about Islam, but he knows what's going around me is not right, right? And he's, as, as much as he can, he's protesting against it. He believes in God. He believes the, the truth will ultimately win. Like he has these set of beliefs. The person who is in protest against shaitan, is he more Muslim or the Muslim who has accepted the system of, of shaitan? Or is he person. more Muslim? This is the dilemma that we're in, in the, in the system that we live in. You see? So, yeah, when you look at it like that, when you say that towards the end, a lot of people will accept Islam, it sounds convincing when, I, when we think of it as, as this definition. But when we think of it as the definition of what we're being told it is, you know, growing up, it doesn't look as convincing. You know, a Muslim is maybe 10% Muslim maximum. Exactly, exactly. Maximum. Exactly. Even the best Muslim can't be 100% Muslim mm. because your, your whole, everything around you, the airwaves, the porn, the music, the, the system, the, the laws, because when you're a citizen of a country, you agree to abide by their laws. Mm. So you're 10% Muslim, 12% Muslim, but the majority of you is in uh, okay with, uh, you know, unless you're living in protest. Yeah. You're clearly living in protest. And a true Muslim has to be living in protest. Mm. You know, on the, the, on the ayah on after Surah al Ayatul Kursi is very, <laughs> la ikrah fid deen. There's no compulsion in deen. But the truth has been made clear from falsehood. Right? La ikrah fid deen. Qad tabayya nurshlu min ghay. Allahumma salli ala. La ikrah fid deen. Qad tabayya nurshlu min ghay. Faman yakfur bit taahut. You have to do kufr of ta'ud first. Exactly, exactly. Otherwise, you're just like the there's the Kaaba there and the idols are there. What's the difference? Mm. You have to remove the idols first, then say I believe in Allah. Mm. Right? Mm. The system is such the Kaaba is there. They don't care about that. Mm. As long as you allow us to have our idols around the Kaaba, mm. our ideas, our systems, our laws, our our symbols, mm. our our you know everything. Uh, is around the Kaaba. You have the, the things, Kaaba is fine. The things that really matter, basically. <laughs> yes. And mm -hmm. so, you know, so we're in a situation where the Muslim believes, says, I believe in Allah, mm -hmm. Allahu Akbar, but Shaitan is also Akbar because I believe in his mm -hmm. laws, his system. Mm -hmm. Right? Is he more Muslim or the, or the non Muslim who believes in God, doesn't know about Islam, but says, no, this is all bad. I don't agree with it. I only mm -hmm. agree with the rub of the Kaaba. Mm. But he doesn't know about Prophet Muhammad. He doesn't know about the beauty of Islam. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, something that really makes me angry is that whenever... And there are more Christians of this type than there are Muslims of this type. Exactly. Yeah, I think so. I believe so. That, yep. that's, what, that's what I was about to uh, kind of reiterate. Because whenever I go to uh, YouTube and uh, I see most of these... Uh, so here, over here, I just wanted to be clear in case somebody sees this video and starts giving me... Yeah, yeah. But was on me. <laughs> yeah. There's a difference between being legally Muslim and then being, you can say, uh, actually, uh, yes. So here, here, you know, uh, there is lahu aslama, surrendering to him, meaning to Allah, his, his way. Legally Muslim is the one who only accepts Islam by his lips. Ikrarum bil lisan. I go to the court. I say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Now I can marry a Muslim girl. I can inherit from a Muslim father. I can have all the rights of any Muslim. I'm legally Muslim. Okay? Legally Muslim. We, ha we have a lot of legal Muslims. But we don't have any iman, which is why we can't see. Spirituality. The spirituality. So now, this in is, this sense, the world we live in today, the there is a lot of legal Muslims. Mm -hmm. They have ikrarum bil lisan and they have tasdikum bil qalb to some degree. But the basira is they're not legal Muslims. They're kafir legally, right? Allah will judge on the day of judgment what their real status is. Legally, they're not Muslims because they haven't gone to the court or in front of people and claimed the shahada, right? So they're not legally Muslims. Legally, they're non-Muslims. Okay, But spiritually, they have more insight. They're more in tune with the, the Rahmani. And you'll see this with Christians. They talk about the love of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God a hundred times more than we do. Mm -hmm. 
it, you know, the, the, their whole premises is built upon this. And, and they believe, even though they have been proven wrong by their pastors giving dates and giving this and giving, you know, this group and that group, but they believe in the Antichrist and this and that, uh, you know, down to the core. And these are the Christians that are also against Israel. Mm. And, and on that note, you know, brother, uh, brother Sami said something actually a couple of months ago that really resonated with me was that when he talked about Musa alayhi uh, encounter with Kidr, and brother Sami was saying that uh, Musa was coming with with uh, all the legalization, yeah, with all the legalizations, and Kidr was the spiritual side, mm. right? And that's something that I still, you know, I I tell people about that, you know, that we have to be really in tune with the spirituality and the spirituality mm. is that taqwa that taqwa needs to be 100 percent. and i this is just my opinion that to understand or sorry to see allah you have to know how he his creations are mm. and the way i see it is i know golden ratio from the body to in nature to space to our dna and then now i can see allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and i can see how beautiful everything is and then you can see who is actually using these proportions and diagrams and manipulating people through all these things right mm -hmm. and so subhanallah there's so much knowledge i just it's overwhelming. Yeah, what you, uh, we, we've still got a lot to learn from you check yeah. check what you what you said today was so beautiful in the meeting because when you said that Islam is the balance. So uh, Musa, mm. he brought the law and then Khidr brought the spiritual side. So whatever Khidr was doing, Musa was saying, look at my book. It says you cannot kill the boy. You mm. cannot harm the boat. Or so. And then Khidr was saying, no, no, no. Have patience. I have the Take wisdom. I have Take the wisdom. Picture. I know the picture. So for us, the lesson is we have to be balanced with the law and the spirit. You have to be in the middle path. Mm. We cannot be too much spiritual like the Naqshbandis or too much law like the Salafis. We have to be like just in the middle, just walking that line, you know, of Islam, which is peace. Because yeah. with the balance, the peace is here. If you're too much left, too much right, there is no peace. There's unrest. Yeah. But in the balance, there is peace. And, and then, instead of uh, whenever I go to YouTube, I get angry because I see all these Muslim dying. Their main content is refuting Christians and making yeah. alienating Christians. I'm saying, why, why can't you just show them the middle path of Islam mm. and show them the beauty instead of refuting them and debating contests, which, which is created yeah. more division, showing them hatred. Why don't you just say, oh, we're in the middle path and we will fight Shaitan together and then we can have intellectual dialogue. But before, like even forbidding evil, you're not even enjoying good. You're just debating, debating. Where is the peace? Where is the middle class? Yeah. Sheikh, on that, did you come across anything about Prophet Daniel? I know that uh, uh, Daniel, okay. alayhi salatu I don't know if you heard my, uh, or if you're hearing my translations of uh, Noreen bin Hamad's uh, Kitab al Yeah, I was sent something uh, from what uh, you did, yeah. So one of the narrations says that they found the body of the Ni'al alayhi salatu wasalam in the time of Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu. Mm -hmm. This is in Nu'aim bin Hamad's uh, mm -hmm. hadith. Now, with his body, they found a book, mm -hmm. which is known as the book of Daniel. They considered it important enough to translate it in Arabic. They specifically said it talks about the end of times, mm -hmm. meaning this is the Rawi. The Rawi says this, we found the grave of Daniel. We dug out 12 different graves. So no one will know which grave he's actually dug in. With his body, we found a book. We told Umar bin Khattab about it. He had, And we told him it's a book that talks about the end of times. And Umar was very uh, concerned about end of times, by the way. Because he knew he was the door between after he dies, the fifth and start, right? If you remember that narration, uh, I also mentioned that. And, you know, he wouldn't allow anything, like he wouldn't allow anybody to build tall buildings. It was not allowed in his khilafah. It was his, his own ijtihad. He didn't allow anybody to build tall buildings. because, he, And he kept asking about signs of the day of judgment, things like this. It was very So when he heard that the, the Prophet Daniel has been found and that there's a book of Daniel with him, Umar bin Khattab had that book translated. Right, so that's so like do we have that book. 
So that's in every Bible is the book of Daniel. I don't know if we have that, the one that Umar bin Khattab had translated okay. would happen to. I don't know that. I know that there's a narration that talks about this in the Kitab al Fitan of Nuaim bin Hamad. Mm -hmm. That's there. The signs are there that we need to look at this book. It keeps coming in my messages from different people. Uh, and when you mentioned it as well, especially um, listening to the Christian eschatologists about the fact that Prophet Daniel engaged in the te technologies of that time and he was making dua to Allah as well. That, Ya Allah, you know, I'm only engaging in this technology just so then I can do your work. You know, I'm hearing things like this and it's just telling me that we. Well, I mean, you could tell that Daniel was the main advisor to Zulkarnain, right? Right, okay. And Zulkarnain was the, at the top of the technology of his time. In fact, Allah says, wa sababa, right? He followed the means, mm -hmm. right? So you have. Uh, uh, Khidr and Musa, like they have no means, right? And then you have Zulqarnain uh, uh, that has all the means. Uh, I'm trying to find the narration for you about. Uh, I think it was emailed to me actually, just uh, literally uh, before I saw you. I think it was from what you shared, I think. No, I, I did a, uh, the audio recording on that uh, in the Kitab al Fitan, though. I don't know if any if you're aware of that, but I'm doing a translation of Kitab al Fitan, just 10 ahadiths at a time. Uh, Is that your son? Yeah. yeah. MashaAllah. Lovely. Uh, he's probably thinking, uh, when are these guys going to finish? <laughs> I don't know what he's thinking. <laughs> uh, yeah, I will find it. I know it's 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 here somewhere. Uh, I just need to. No, actually, yeah, this isn't what I thought it was. Yet. Hey, inshallah, I'll find it. Uh, okay, right. I think, I think, yeah, Jazakallah Keshek, I think you've given us more than the time we deserve. Um, oh, and he's come just back in time as well. So, uh, yeah, so we'll just um, finish off here. Um, yeah, Jazakallah Keshek for your time, and um, we look forward to uh, carrying on this work that we're doing and presenting yeah, more, take more it, information take it to as you, far as it can go, inshallah. Um, if if you want, if you all four agree, send me the link to this, and I'll upload yeah, it. Yeah, I and think then, so. I think the you know, people will agree, yeah. people will benefit from this, and I, then they will be interested in, um, you know, the part two and part three of this. Yeah, um, brother, brother yeah. Iman's doing a great job, as it says, end game. He's behind the end game production. So I just wanted to say, yeah, Alhamdulillah, you know, this this uh, channel mm -hmm. was brought to you by these brothers here. And this channel is for the Muslim Ummah that is, that is, you know, our, that's rising now. We're rising up. We're sick and tired of being put down and, you know, being always at the short end of stick. And now we are going to stand up with the book of Allah. That is what we're going to do is standing up with the book of Allah. And we need that's everybody. It. We need yeah. everybody. We can't, it's not just us four. It's everybody that we need. Is there, if we're going to upload this, then is there a place where they can reach you? Do you have a YouTube channel? Do you have... Yeah. Some way where Muslims, it's, huh? It's we're called Endgame. Yeah, yeah we're, we're making. Um, we want to make uh, this this uh, Surah Rahman as our as our Entry. moment. Uh, our, as, as, as they say, as the phoenix rise up, right? So <laughs> when we be <laughs> careful with that phoenix. That phoenix we're gonna, re we're gonna release this one, and then I have yeah. some interviews. Yeah, but planned. where are you gonna release it? On YouTube, on YouTube. Check that. You can. Are you, you gonna have can a release? Yeah, yeah we can already release have a on channel. your channel. And we'll yeah, I'll release it on my channel, but you should have your own thing for your own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah we have a, it's, it's called Endgame, uh, Endgame Productions. Um, uh, I will, we'll, I'll, we'll forward it to you, and then you can add it to yeah, your. Yeah. So if people, if people put in the search engine Endgame Productions on YouTube, they'll find it. Yeah. No, no, it probably won't show up because there's so many. We're still new, right? So we're gonna have to go through through the link. Um, 
And uh, I just want to give a disclaimer that uh, please don't attack us and say we're not scholars. <laughs> no, no, not turn, turn those comment sections no, off. No, again, we're, no. We're, uh, don't attack us, say we're a bunch of nobodies. Or no. We know we're not scholars. We know we're, that's why we had Sheikh on. Our our inspiration is when uh, Omar Adiyalana says, whoever seeks honor outside Islam, Allah will dishonor him. We are taking our honor in Islam. Islam is our honor. So, mm. so whatever we you are want, students of knowledge. I mean, you know, as some of you are in my Arabic class, or all of you were in my Arabic class to some degree. Um, so you know, you're students of knowledge. You're learning, and this is part of the growing process. Sheikh, and, I, yeah, I follow most of the videos you upload. So yeah, uh, even uh, your Arabic classes aside, um, mm. yeah, I I'm not trying to. Uh, butter you up or anything but there is no one else out there um, that is that is speaking the same language as most of us people it can't be just by chance that there's this massive group of people around the world right that is looking to find someone who's speaking the truth and is in line with what we're seeing and thinking so yeah so um, anyway i just want to say follow all of your videos that you upload anyway and just have a care for all the work that you do I, I want do to dua for me, you guys do dua for. I mean, I will do dua for you guys do dua for me. Inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, Sheikh, I wanted to just uh, mention to everyone that we should uh, aspire to become the people of the Quran because uh, yes, that's the, it is the future. It is yeah. the future. Quran, Quran, absolutely. This is what it's all about, Quran. Yeah. All right, thank you, Jazakallah. Okay. Yeah. Jazakallah.